Uh, good morning. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Scott Pomeroy, who is a Bronson Crothers Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School and Neurologist in Chief and Chair of the Department of Neurology at Boston Children's Hospital and the 2022 Faye Salkowski Lecturer in Child Neurology. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of uh, background comments about the Faye Salkowski and Salkowski Foundation support for the Division of Neurology, which has made this possible before telling you a little bit more about Dr. Pomeroy's distinguished career. The Herman and Faye Sarkowski Foundation was founded in 1982 and has made many contributions to the arts, Jewish, Jewish organizations, health and human service organizations. The relationship with the Division of Neurology here is longstanding and provides a fund to support our academic mission and an endowed chair. This particular lectureship was established in 1995 with the intention of inviting people from any field, PhDs, physicians who've made co significant contributions to the field of child neurology, which Dr. Pomeroy is one. The luminaries who've come here uh, in to give this lecture include major figures in child neurology, including William Mobley, Victor Dilbovitz, Donna Ferrero, Hugo Moser, John Icardi. Dr. Pomeroy himself has made many contributions um, to our, our field. His research focuses on understanding the molecular and cellular basis of medulloblastomas, which he will talk about today, and embryonal brain tumors. He was the first MD PhD trained at the University of Cincinnati. He then completed training in child neurology at St. Louis Children's Hospital uh, before going to Boston. He's received numerous awards, including the Child Neurology Young Investigator Award in 1989. He's also made major contributions to the field of child neurology, both as an advocate for, uh, for families and through his clinical and basic science research. Recognized through numerous awards, including the Sidney Carter Award of the American Academy of Neurology, Daniel Drake Medal at the University of Cincinnati, and he was the first to receive the Compassionate Caregiver Award of the Kenneth Schwartz Center, and also received the Bernard Sachs Award from the Child Neurology Society. In recognition of its scientific achievements, was elected as a member of the National Academy of Medicine in 2017. And today he's going to talk to us about precision medicine strategies for medulloblastoma uh, therapy. And Scott, well, welcome, and we are delighted to have you here. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, it is uh, uh, honestly a, a great honor to give the Faye Sarkowski lecture, and uh, I only Wish I could be there uh, with you and and do this in person. I, I love Seattle. My father's from Idaho, so I have uh, many uh, personal connections to the Northwest and and uh, just love the region. And uh, maybe one day uh, I can visit in person. So I thought it would be worthwhile uh, to consider the uh, state of medulloblastoma therapy and and uh, in the light of recent developments, especially in the last 10 years, there's been a, a really dramatic increase in understanding of the basic cellular and molecular mechanisms of the disease. And uh, probably more so than, I'm, I'm certain, more so than any other era uh, in understanding this disease. So we're still uh, working our way through what that means in terms of uh, modifying therapy for the disease. And, and you might imagine, uh, now that we have a much better understanding of the molecular basis of the disease, that perhaps this is a moment that uh, you know, we can switch off the radiation machines and stop giving chemotherapy and just give pills uh, that target specific mechanisms. But I think, uh, as, as I will show you in this, this lecture, uh, life is not so easy. Uh, there, there has to be a transition to precision medicine, and it's always uh, based on uh, pragmatic issues uh, as as we go forward. And so, what I what I'll do is describe um, the changes that have occurred, how we uh, now view the the disease in terms of this uh, new uh, cellular and molecular uh, terminology, and then begin to show how it's impacting our our treatment. Uh, uh, currently, and where we're going in terms of trying to find uh, new treatments 
based on an understanding of molecular mechanisms. So just, uh, I have no disclosures uh, to make or conflicts of interest here are my grants. So to put medulloblastomas into context, um, this pie chart published in, in 2015 actually is already out of date, but I think it makes uh, a point uh, for uh, the modern view of medulloblastomas and other uh, now we call them embryonal tumors. Um, so as you can see, the majority, this is uh, a pie chart of all pediatric brain tumors, which are, are not common, 5.26 per 100,000. Majority are, are astrocytomas and the embryonal tumor piece of pie is about 15% of all those uh, tumors, of, of all uh, pediatric brain tumors. And medulloblastomas make up almost two-thirds of that, uh, that pie chart. We used to say uh, 20 years ago that medulloblastomas account for about somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of all pediatric brain tumors. And, and it's been modified now because we have come to recognize that what we used to call medulloblastomas actually were a variety of other types of tumors. So, for instance, in the 1990s, a typical teratoid rhabdoid tumors were identified as a separate type of tumor that resembles medulloblastoma. In fact, at a histology level, it, it may be indistinguishable, but they have a very poor prognosis. So once we identified those tumors and stopped calling them medulloblastomas, the prognosis of medulloblastoma itself improved substantially just because we removed a, a very poor prognosis uh, a component that we used to uh, consider to be part of the spectrum of medulloblastomas. And this story, uh, that type of story will continue uh, throughout my talk. We also uh, had a category of tumor, primitive neuroectodermal tumor, or PNET, which uh, now no longer exists. That's been, that terminology has been removed from the lexicon, and I'll show you uh, how that has evolved. Mesuloblastoma itself is a tumor uh, principally of the cerebellum. Here's a, an image showing one right here, kind of the midline sagittal view of, of a mesuloblastoma compressing both the cerebellum and brainstem. These tumors have a tendency to spread throughout the neuraxis, occasionally. Uh, beyond, but quite rarely, but uh, uh, usually uh, if, if they spread, it's within the neuraxis. And because of that, after surgical excision, they're treated with radiation to both the brain and spine. And the, and the traditional dose uh, to the brain was 3,600 centigrade, and then multi-drug chemotherapy for about a year. And if one does this using old criteria for risk, that is for standard risk, M0, no evidence of metastasis, less than 1.5 centimeters of residual disease in children who are greater than three years old, five-year survival is about 80%. And for high-risk disease uh, with uh, either metastatic or lots of residual disease, it was uh, significantly lower, 65%. But that's just the beginning of the story because when you irradiate the child of, uh, who is uh, three or or up to about nine, the con the consequences of radiation are devastating. If you follow them over time, uh, it really dramatically alters uh, cognitive function, and, and to the extent that in, in the worst case scenario, in very young children, as many as almost forty point uh, decline of of IQ. So, really substantial reduction of the quality of life of survivors, even though the survival rate. It's not uh, ex excessively uh, bad. So there's a lot of room for improvement, uh, to say the least. So we began our journey uh, to try to understand medulloblastomas uh, really three decades ago and used a, as a framework to try to understand the disease, neural development, like why do certain cells in the nervous system, in the developing nervous system, form tumors in children and they don't form those same tumors in adults. It implies that those cells are susceptible to oncogenesis at certain stages of their development, 
and then they lose that susceptibility. So understanding something of the origin of tumors is important to understand uh, the basic biology of the tumors. Another theme that we have introduced uh, in, in our work. And as these tools became available, we began to employ genomic methods, which allowed us to study many genes simultaneously to help get a handle on uh, the, the issues that we're trying to uh, understand molecular basis of the disease, molecular and cellular origins of the disease. And so our initial study uh, looked at, at several different uh, tumors, different uh, histologic subtypes of medulloblastomas, what we used to call primitive neurectodermal tumors, atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors, uh, gliomas, and showed that uh, when you look at the transcriptome of these tumors, they're, they're really very distinct from one another. So the, the chart is, uh, a heat map that shows uh, levels of expression of, of uh, genes. Each column is a gene, each, I'm sorry, each column is a tumor, each row is a, is a gene, and red is high levels of expression. And each of these tumor types has a different uh, pattern of expression, as you can see here. And if then you project those tumors into three-dimensional space using uh, the top three principal components, principal component analysis, you can see that they tend to segregate in, in specific regions of the of, uh, gene expression space. So atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors, whether they come from kidneys or nervous system, all tend to, to cluster together. Same with medulloblastomas, gliomas. And these tumors that we call PNETs, primitive neuroectodermal tumors, tended to be with, in between all of these. It was a, 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 a uh, kind of in between all the different types of tumors. It turns out then uh, when uh, precision increased over the next uh, several years, this is a paper that was published in 2016, just a year after that classification I uh, showed you at the beginning of the talk, looked at now hundreds of what were termed to be supertentorial peanuts. It turns out that they, they are a whole host of different tumors. Some of them are, are gliomas, high-grade gliomas, in other cases, they're medulloblastomas. There were some new entities that were emerging at the time, an embryonal tumor with multilayer rosettes or ETMR or a CNS neuroblastoma. So all those tumors uh, that used to be called peanuts are now given specific diagnoses based on the new molecular classification that we're able to, to make. And, and that's important because now not only do we have an indication of of the, the, what they actually are and what their prognosis is, but we're beginning to get a handle on um, uh, mechanisms that then we may be able to target in the future. And, and they're not all extremely poor prognosis. Most of these are, are not so great, uh, but uh, we, we have some variability of prognosis even with this uh, reclassification. So as of 2016, the World Health Organization classification eliminated PNET, and now we call them uh, whatever uh, type of tumor uh, they happen to end up being using the new molecular classification. When we focused on medulloblastomas themselves, we knew from the outset that there's a great deal of clinical heterogeneity. Even though they look very similar under the microscope, there were some tumors that responded very well to treatment and others that just did not, kind of accounting for the variability of outcome that I showed you at the beginning. And we really had no clue as to why uh, they did uh, have such a difference of, of uh, response to uh, treatment. And, and as we began to look into this in greater detail, we discovered why, because it turns out that medulloblastomas are actually uh, consists of, oh, sorry, several different subtypes that uh, are each defined by gene expression in the same way that we are able to see different types of uh, tumors from different locations. In this case, we took 200, over 200 medulloblastomas, segregated them into groups using a method called non-negative matrix factorization, which allows you to optimize the number of uh, subtypes that a set of unknown samples can be categorized into, into the optimal number. And the solution for this, uh, you can see, there were several groups that congregate. Some are very are quite clean. So this one right here 
and this one right here are very uh, sharply defined, whereas there's a group here that's uh, not so clear. We call it C1 and C5, and uh, here C2 and C4. Uh, there's some heterogeneity within those tumors uh, by gene expression profile. And then when we took the gene expression profile and subjected it to methods like gene set enrichment analysis to try to define underlying mechanisms, the C3 group turned out to have a very strong sonic hedgehog signature, C6 uh, Wnt, and the C1 in particular, but C1 and C5 MIC uh, signature. And so uh, by international consensus uh, around that time, we agreed, uh, there were other groups that, that found similar results, that there were essentially four major subtypes of medulloblastoma, sonic hedgehog, defined group, went. Because of its heterogeneity, we hesitated to call uh, C1, C5 MIC, although it does tend to have MIC dominant signature. So we called this group three, and then C2, C4, uh, group four. When we looked at the genetic basis of these subtypes, again, segregated by transcriptome, but this time looking at DNA copy number using SNP profiles, you can see that it was there was a reason for that logic that, that each of these transcriptome defined subtypes really has a different uh, genetic signature based on DNA copy numbers, and it makes sense in many ways. So, for instance, within the C1, the MIC dominant uh, subtype, uh, in many cases, MIC copy number increased or was overtly amplified. In the case of the sonic hedgehog uh, subtype, the locus of the sonic hedgehog receptor was often deleted. And, uh, and Wnt uh, turns out, for, for reasons we still don't know, to have a single copy of chromosome 6 uh, lost. So again, the, the, the transcriptome uh, reflected the genetic um, abnormalities underlying them, and in many cases uh, evident by DNA whole, whole gains and losses of either whole or parts of chromosomes. So again, this, this was not uh, work that was done in isolation. There was a, a group in Toronto, uh, Michael Taylor's group, Paul Northcott, who, who was finding uh, similar results, a group in at St. Jude uh, similarly uh, found the same, and then in, in Heidelberg, ultimately. So we all met and agreed upon a nomenclature, which I've already told you, went Sonic Hedgehog Group 3, Group 4. Uh, the wind subtype is uh, notable for one, having uh, relatively low levels of metastasis in a really excellent outcome, 95% survival uh, using the, the treatments uh, that uh, were used at that time. Sonic hedgehog subtype has an interesting uh, demographic profile in that there's an, an increased incidence of sonic hedgehog subtype in infancy and then it kind of drops to a lower level during childhood and then increases again in adulthood. And these are fundamentally different, even though they seem to be driven by a similar mechanism, their behavior is, is, is uh, quite different. And you can see uh, similarly, group three and group four have a, a different age profile. Oop. Sorry, group three um, has a high level of metastasis as compared to the others, group four a little bit farther behind, and, and group three tumors tend to have a, a poor prognosis. In fact, if you look within that one category, the C1 group that has MIC amplification, it's even below 50%. It's probably closer to 30% overall survival. So the differences that we experience through the years of, you know, why do some tumors respond to treatment and others don't, in the end is a reflection of the heterogeneity, the molecular heterogeneity of the tumors. The some, the very good prognosis ones that responded well to therapy, some of them were when subtype tumors. And the very poor one, the prognosis ones that did not respond to therapy were group three. And we just couldn't distinguish them using histology alone. The histology just is not sufficiently accurate that one could categorize these subtypes. In fact, we didn't even know these subtypes existed until the molecular profiling became available. And, and that wasn't until really 2010. So um, 
a big change in the way that we think about uh, these tumors. When we look more deeply at the genetic under uh, abnormalities underlying the tumors, one of the first things that we found, and it was it turned out to be true for other pediatric cancers, is that the rate of somatic mutation is very low compared to other cancers that occur in adults. So, for instance, melanomas and lung cancers have somatic mutation rates that are, that are 100 times more frequent uh, than in medulloblastoma. So, that it, it, it probably no surprise kids don't smoke and hang out in the sun and, and et cetera at the same level that adults do, don't accumulate uh, mutations. And also, I think, getting back to the original uh, concept that we began, uh, with there are certain cells in children in the developing brain that are uniquely susceptible to oncogenesis, and it does not take very many mutations to set a tumor, uh, a normal cell, into uh, the path to become a tumor. If we then overlay the types of somatic mutations that occur on the uh, transcriptome profile, the logic was very clear. So, for instance, in this case, the Wnt subtype, the upper panel is, is DNA copy number, SNP data, lower panel, single gene uh, mutations. The most common mutation in, in uh, the Wnt subtype is, is the gene that encodes beta catenin. So, that's completely logical. And the most common gene, and no other subtype has that mutation, similarly, Genes involved in the sonic hedgehog pathway are mutated within the sonic hedgehog subtype, but not in the other subtypes. In some cases, uh, we were able to pick up germline mutations uh, in the, uh, the data sets. And there are some subtypes. Uh, so, for instance, this is the C5 part of group three. Really has no frequently recurring uh, mutations. It, almost all of the abnormalities that are consistent are in DNA copy numbers. And, and the uh, logic uh, behind what's driving the tumors is a little less clear other than uh, in, in the cases where MYC is amplified. Similarly, group four has uh, is dominated more by copy number change than it is by specific mutations or, or mutations of genes that regulate gene transcription rather than uh, genes that are part of a canonical signaling pathway. So we don't have a full understanding of the logic of what's driving these tumors, but it's certainly uh, a little more clear than it was uh, before we had these uh, molecular profiles. We also used to say, uh, again, moving in, you know, as a component of precision medicine, we also used to say that medulloblastomas and childhood cancers in general have a pretty low uh, germline mutation rate. We would we would say probably less than five percent, and it turns out that that's uh, actually not true. That uh, depending on the subtype of tumors, this is a paper that came out in two thousand eighteen. The mutation rate could be uh, a germline mutation rate could be significantly higher. So, for instance, within the sonic hedgehog subtype, there are a number of genes that can be mutated and are actually you know quite functionally significant in the biology of the tumors. Uh, and and uh, and occur in, in a germline uh, fashion. So, for instance, mutation of the gene patched uh, heterozygous uh, carriers of that mutation have a condition called Gorlin syndrome uh, that leads to excessive occurrence of uh, medulloblastomas and basal cell carcinomas uh, and, and other abnormalities as well. And Patients who have uh, mutations of TP53 or leaf from many syndrome also have uh, a high incident, higher incidence of medulloblastoma. It's of the sonic hedgehog subtype, not of other subtypes. And this is a uh, substantially poor prognosis. It's sufficiently poor uh, prognosis if, if a sonic hedgehog tumor occurs with P53 mutation that the World Health Organization gave it a separate category in its 2016 classification. As you can see, there are other significant demographic aspects in terms of age at which they occur, whether or not there's positive family history or evidence uh, uh, suggestive of a genetic predisposition. 
so that today, uh, when we begin uh, this process of diagnosis and, and setting up treatment for patients with these tumors, genetic counseling has become an important component of uh, our uh, initial processes. So for instance, in the wind subtype, if the tumor is found to not have somatic mutation of the beta catenin gene, there's a very high probability that they're actually carrying germline mutation of APC, another component of the wind pathway. Sonic hedgehog tumors, as I showed you in the previous uh, slide, have a number of genes that are important uh, in, in the pathogenesis of the disease. These should be uh, sought uh, in both in looking at germline DNA and also uh, important for genetic counseling. And similarly, um, for group three and group four tumors, especially if there's a, a, a suggestive family history, uh, genes such as PALB2 and, and BRCA should be uh, sequenced. So again, the, the, the um, component of precision medicine that we can introduce at this point is to have a better handle on the uh, biological substrate of the tumor and the risk to the patient and their family of uh, oncogenesis. So WHO in 2016 um, came out with a revision of the fourth edition of uh, their, their uh, classification of CNS tumors. And for the first time, uh, not just for medulloblastomas, but for other tumors as well, introduced a molecular classification. And so for medulloblastomas, it, it followed along the lines of what we came up with, went activated tumors, low risk tumor, very good prognosis, sonic hedgehog activated TP53 mutant, very poor prognosis tumor, and then sonic hedgehog P53 wild type. And then and they just basically lumped group three and group four into non-went, non-sonic hedgehog with kind of group three and group four as uh, a, a molecular classification with no particular uh, relevance to um, clinical uh, outcomes except for the uh, BIC amplified uh, subtype, which has a, a often a, an anaplastic uh, histology. So we began to segregate into uh, a, a more a richer classification instead of just standard risk, high risk, we have a low risk tumor, the went activated type, a very high risk tumor, the sonic hedgehog P53 mutant, and then back to kind of standard risk versus uh, high risk by uh, classification that we've used from based on clinical criteria in the past. This uh, Nomenclature has been revised uh, in a new edition of the Sun of the uh, World Health Organization uh, classification that just came out. I, I just got my book uh, a week or two ago, and it, it's said to have come out in 2021, but uh, the book just became available. And it, this has largely been retained. That there's now uh, clearly been defined uh, subtypes of the sonic hedgehog uh, tumors that are at a molecular level that are now clinically significant, especially in infants. There are now uh, emerging subtypes within infancy that one class has, has a really excellent prognosis and is treated exclusively with chemotherapy and, and another has a less lesser uh, prognosis, but uh, still responds to other types of chemotherapy. So, so we're beginning to hone in on these various subtypes uh, as even as we, uh, proceed uh, with the, uh, the current approach to, th to treatment. Just to remind you, you know, so sonic hedgehog tumors uh, are, are uh, driven by the sonic hedgehog pathway. There's a, a, an abundance of evidence, both from animal models and, and other evidence that they're derived from uh, external, uh, uh, from granule cell progenitors, uh, tumor uh, cells that in the normal development that form the external granule cell layer, migrate over time uh, past the Purkinje cell layer to form the internal granule cell layer. And sonic hedgehog is uh, 
part of what drives the proliferation of the EGL cells through binding to the patched receptor, a transmembrane brain receptor that in its unbound state tonically inhibits another molecule smoothened in a very complex um, process that involves primary cilia, a topic of uh, a lecture in, in its own, uh, and through a, a family of transcription factors, the GLE transcription factors drive um, gene expression. And in the case of uh, where there's uh, a loss of patch, either through mutation or by loss of the patched locus on the chromosome, smooth and is left constitutively activated, driving genes that drive the, the uh, proliferation of external granule cells. And if you look in mice that have uh, a loss of one copy of patched, what you'll find is that about uh, 20 to 25 percent of them have rests of, of persistently per, uh, proliferating granule cells, about a, a fifth of which uh, go on to form medulloblastomas, uh, presumably through additional genetic abnormality, the accrual of additional genetic abnormalities or potentially epigenetic mechanisms that are altered uh, as those cells proliferate. So you might imagine then, that, you know, given that this is a, a, a pathway that uh, has, uh, you know, a, a signaling transduct, signal transduction mechanism that you could then block the pathway somewhere along the way. And it turns out the drugs that block this pathway largely target smoothened. And so genes that then activate patched when should in fact be uh, tumors that with patch activation or loss of patch, fun, patch, patch function and therefore gain of smoothing uh, function should respond to these drugs. And in fact, they do. But as you might expect, if there are mutation, activating mutations downstream of smoothing, they will not uh, respond to this uh, uh, drug. And, and sure enough, uh, that has been uh, shown to be the case. So if one then looks across the different age ranges of what are the activating mutations that occur, either somatic or germline, in these different tumors? For infants, although patched is often mutated, similarly, it's pressor refused or SUFU uh, is, is a pretty common uh, mutation. So downstream of smoothing and therefore not responsive to um, the smoothened inhibitors. Similarly, as somewhat older kids, uh, may have gain of function through amplification or increased copy numbers of the Glee transcription factors or of MYC, which is downstream of, MYC, of, of MYC and downstream of Glee. And uh, sure enough, those as well did not respond to these smoothened blockers. So what can one do? Well, perhaps one could target, you know, the downstream mechanisms. Not easy to do, but there are drugs that do target uh, through the that bromine that promo domain inhibit inhibitor mechanism, uh, experimental drug JQ1, uh, perhaps could be a treatment for these tumors that are activated downstream of smooth. And then sure enough, in, in, uh, at least in cell-based models, cells uh, grown in culture that have wild type smoothened are responsive to the smoothened inhibitors and also the JQ1, the bet bromo domain inhibitor, Whereas one that has uh, a, a uh, activating uh, smoothen mutation that renders it insensitive to the smoothen drug doesn't respond to that, but still responds to uh, JQ1. So in theory, um, uh, JQ1 or other drugs that target that mechanism would be a good drug. It turns out uh, in clinical practice, uh, life was, was not so clean. And uh, the JQ1 drug uh, has, has not uh, uh, proven to be uh, a great drug for treatment. So activating mutations downstream of smoothened are, are a challenge for this tumor. And it also turns out that the smoothened inhibiting drugs uh, also target patched in other uh, domains of the body and uh, in particular growth plates of, of bone because the hedgehog family also is important for, for bone growth. And so uh, they're not particularly good, useful drugs in children. 
Well, what other genes can we go after? I, if one looks across all the mutations that occur in their frequency, you can see uh, that most uh, genes do not occur, have, have recurring uh, mutations in a large number of tumors. This is uh, uh, several hundred tumors looking at the frequency of, of gene mutation across the different subtypes. And the only subtype that has really high frequency of recurrence is uh, the wind subtype, so beta catenin mutation and another gene, DDX3X. But the other genes involved are, are uh, as individual genes, rarely uh, recurrently mutated, looking across large numbers of tumors. If one looks at them functionally, however, uh, many target different aspects of gene transcription, many different genes uh, that are involved in either horm uh, the modification of histones or of altering uh, DNA, uh, uh, the state of DNA and in, in, in the regulation of transcription. Uh, and so uh, a, another line of investigation is to look at those sites uh, and try to uh, develop drugs that target uh, the various mechanisms that are involved in remodeling histone modification uh, transcription itself or, or transcription factors themselves. Uh, all experimental approaches to developing therapies, nothing yet uh, as a real breakthrough. Other approaches that uh, can be used to try to identify potential targets include um, very looking at uh, different gene expression signatures to try to identify um, cells types that are are uniquely sensitive to um, by, at, a, at a gene expression level uniquely sensitive to drugs. So we we did some work uh, in, along those lines, which I'll show you briefly. And and then um, we have re more recently looked at proteomics and phosphoproteomics to look for signatures uh, that uh, might be targetable uh, in the proteome. So what one of the approaches we used, as I said, was to, to, to take expression profiles of tumors using the, this multiple gene expression profile, use single cell, uh, single sample GSEA to project uh, the MRI and our mRNA data set onto a panel of tumors that have been subjected to uh, various drugs and, and whose ex gene expression profile has uh, been defined, match up the, the cell lines that are sensitive to drug with the, the cells uh, from the, the, the signatures from the tumors and try to come up with an, an appropriate match in CDK. Four six inhibitors came uh, out of that, uh, and, and in fact, uh, are, are in clinical trial. So far, not a, not a lot of uh, response uh, that we can see. Example of how we uh, proceeded with the proteome. Uh, it's actually, a really interesting uh, project that we did with Stephen Parr, who had developed uh, a, a panel of, of phospho. Uh, proteome sites that map specific uh, uh, serine threonine and uh, tyrosine motifs so that you could you could tell like within MIC if there are certain sites that are phosphorylated or not in the phosphoproteome. And um, this subjected to the same kind of analysis that we use for a transcriptome analysis, we came up with an interesting potential target PRKDC, which is a uh, kinase that, that phosphorylates serine 62 of MYC and leads to a stabilization of MYC. So, in potentially inhibiting PRKDC uh, and therefore decreasing the phosphorylation state of uh, serine 62 will lead to the MYC being degraded through the, the um, ubiquitination and, and uh, proteolysis process. And when we subjected um, cell lines to this drug, we, we found that they became more sensitive to uh, radiation at um, 
lower levels of the uh, drug. So potentially uh, a, a way to proceed, although unfortunately there's no, at the moment, there's no PRKDC drug available. So I thought it would just be useful to, to show you know, like some of the ways that we and others are, are beginning to look for other targets that can be uh, targeted through these uh, specific uh, treatments, but uh, unfortunately, you know, not too much progress in, in coming up with treatments that replace the conventional therapies. So what can we do? Well, one thing we can do is, is to be more precise in our uh, treatment. So for instance, for wind subtype tumors, especially those that are average risk, which almost all of them are, there's now consensus, international consensus to lower the radiation dose to the brain and spine. And it's now uh, pretty consistently in the range of 15 to 1800 uh, centigrade. Uh, to remind you, 3,600 is, is the standard dose. Uh, and some are even going a little bit lower than that. And so far, there's been no evidence that by lowering the dose of radiation to this level, that we're having uh, tumors escape, that there are, there are excessive numbers of treatment failures, even with this lower radiation dose. And in addition, conventional chemotherapy, which mostly is cisplatin, uh, then christine based often with cyclophosphamide or VP16 added to it, we can cut down the amount of christine and decrease um, the uh, uh, residual peripheral neuropathy that is often uh, present in, in survivors of the disease. So a meaningful decrease of radiation to the brain, improving overall quality of life of survivors, in decreased uh, chemotherapy. Uh, if you think about it, um, it's unlikely that you would ever be in a situation where for an individual patient who came to you, you would say, well, we have this treatment that has 95% survival, but has bad side effects, let's eliminate the treatment and replace it with a, a treatment that has uh, unknown um, efficacy, it's not going to happen. I, it, it will be a process of substitution and of, of elimination uh, through that. Now, if we ever come up with, and hopefully uh, there, there's uh, evidence that, you know, WINT inhibiting drugs are on the horizon, uh, that could change if it, if it turned out to be really effective. Uh, we might be able to uh, very rapidly decrease even further the radiation and chemotherapy if we had a drug that effectively inhibited the wind pathway and didn't do bad things to the rest of the body. For Sonic Hedgehog, we now have to find a much higher risk uh, subtype through that has TP53 mutation. And you might imagine, because this is a DNA repair gene, that irradiating these tumors might actually make them worse or treating them with alkylating agents, which act by altering DNA. Um, so there have been some thoughts about using other treatments uh, that, that are less uh, uh, toxic to DNA as the treatments of choice for um, the sonic hedgehog tumors with P53 mutations. Not, I don't think that has resulted in any particular change of treatment uh, of that type, although many of the experimental approaches that we and others have used have, have targeted um, trying to find another mechanism like the CDK46 inhibitors and, and PRKDC data that I showed you, trying to find uh, other mechanisms that we can uh, target to try to improve the outcome of these very poor tumor prognosis tumors. And for the, the other tumors, now that we have a better handle on who has a good prognosis versus a poor prognosis, we can more accurately define uh, risk and use, if, if not the very low dose of radiation, a significantly lower dose of radiation that does indeed have uh, improvements in, in uh, cognitive outcome. So that's the current state of things. Uh, they, there's a lot of uh, uh, movement in trying to come up with other approaches to add to this backbone of treatment. As I said uh, earlier, for infants, this is largely a, a profile of, of 
how we proceed with greater than three year olds for very young children. We're able to define uh, subtypes of tumors that have a very good prognosis, and we're very reluctant to give radiation below the age of three. In fact, almost don't do it. There, there was an a, attempt to uh, eliminate spinal irradiation and just irradiate the uh, tumor bed itself, which really was not particularly successful. So I think you know, sometimes that's done. Um, the emphasis really has been more on trying to use varying doses of, of uh, chemotherapy to try to uh, get those tumors under control. And again, they, there are some that have a sufficiently good prognosis uh, that, that chemotherapy alone uh, is sufficient for tumor control for the very young. So that's the state of precision medicine for medulloblastoma. It's a much better handle on why tumors respond. Some tumors respond, some don't. Uh, what directions we're going to go in terms of developing new therapies uh, and how we can modify conventional therapies to fit a much more well-defined prognosis profile that we can uh, maintain through doing both histologic uh, clinical stratification as well as molecular stratification. We're kind of in between right now. And in the model uh, of diagnosis in the current, even in the current WHO handbook that just came out, combines both histologic and uh, molecular uh, classification in the overall classification of these tumors. So these are many of the people that I've worked with uh, through the years. I've been especially uh, involved with uh, the team at the Broad Institute, some of whom have moved out to uh, UC San Diego. Jill Meseroff and Pablo Tamayo in particular have been longstanding, more than 20 year uh, collaborators in this work. Uh, and at MIT, Ernest Frankel more re recently has been a, a close uh, collaborator, but many people from all over the world uh, Heidelberg, uh, uh, St. Jude, uh, which is in Memphis, uh, are, have been involved in this work. Be very happy to uh, take any questions that you might have. And, and uh, some of the data sets that we uh, have uh, through for through these publications are available through uh, either the Broad uh, uh, website or they tend to be on uh, the the uh, public uh, repositories as well. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, there already is a question in the chat and I'll just remind our viewers that um, you can either ask a question in the chat or you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question live or a combination of those things. I can ask your first question and you can ask a follow-up. So from Carol Chaplet, thanks for your work and discussion. I am wondering if there's a relationship between PNET and NET. Sorry, I may have missed this. Did you use genetics of the tumor? PNETs and, and the genetics? Yes. No, they, these tumors, have, um, they... Uh, so peanuts no longer exist as a category and they break down into various specific tumors like ETMR is, is one, the embryonal tumor with multi-layered rosettes. And those tumors have a characteristic amplification of a microRNA uh, region on chromosome 19. And through the overexpression of those microRNAs, it alters expression of DNA um, methylation genes that ultimately push the cell into kind of an, an undifferentiated state. It's kind of an interesting mechanism that uh, uh, ultimately leaves, the, it, it forces the, 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 the cells into, uh, to remain in an undifferentiated state as a, a very poor prognosis tumor based on microRNA expression. I'm sure other abnormalities accrue as well. So each, each of them has their own unique profile of, of genetic abnormalities. Thanks. I okay, saw so Jeff. Jeff, <laughs> yeah. Do you want me Hi, to read Jeff. his questions out so everyone can hear them? And Jeff, you can unmute too, but I'll read your question. Thanks, Scott. Two questions. Can targeted therapy allow for less aggressive surgery, avoiding brainstem injury and posterior fossa syndrome? Second, how does your group approach the adult needs of survivors with significant neurocognitive sequelae? Thanks. 
So, um, no, I think, uh, you know, you would love to, to uh, be less of a aggressive in the, the surgical approach, especially in the vermis in the region of the uh, deep uh, cerebellar nuclei to avoid the posterior fossa syndrome. But unfortunately, I mean, good for the surgeons, I guess, uh, that's always good for the patient that, you know, removing the tumor is still one of the mainstays of, of brain tumor therapy. The, the more of the tumor that you can remove, the better in most cases. And we don't yet have a treatment that replaces uh, that, at least for medulloblastomas. So um, for adults, uh, they tend to be uh, sonic hedgehog tumors. And some of the earliest cases that were used, uh, where, where the smoothened blockers were used, were actually adults with uh, metastatic uh, medulloblastoma. We didn't know at the time sonic hedgehog medulloblastomas, but now we know. Um, but I, I, I don't think that, that the sonic hedgehog blockers begin because of side effects, et cetera, have become uh, the mainstay of treatment. They're still treated by conventional methods for the most part. We're not there yet. Yeah, Scott, my question was slightly different, which is if you, you have these kids that survive, tumors gone, and then like so many of our chronic diseases, we, we don't really have an effective uh, handoff um, right. when they graduate. So, you know, what do you have any insights into, into that difficult problem? Oh, you mean for the survivors? Exactly. Yeah. Sorry, it wasn't clear. Oh, um, well, that's the next hour. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the consequences of having a brain tumor, and and yeah, it's it's quite um, uh, troubling. I mean, the, 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 those uh, I'm sure you've seen them as well. Those who survive not just medulloblastoma, but many different uh, types of brain tumors have many um, very significant. Uh, sequelae uh, of, of various types, some cognitive, increased risk of stroke, and other um, uh, complicating uh, side effects from the treatment that, uh, again, drive us to want to come up with more precise treatments that, that would allow us to use less radiation, less aggressive surgery, and, and uh, uh, less chemotherapy. But we're not there yet. We're, we're on our way. We've made some improvements, but we have a long way to go. Thank you. Um, from Yuli Goost, I have a question on the clinical trials. How do we deal with all the splitting into smaller and smaller subgroups? Yeah, I mean, it, it really means that, uh, you know, if, if it was ever obvious before, it's very obvious now. You just can't go, go it alone. I mean, you, you really have to work collaboratively with others. And, and in fact, for some subtypes, like like the wind subtype, uh, for instance, which is like ten percent, we've 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 been in active discussions with Europe and try to come up with you know pan North America and European trials that bring together all the patients uh, that we can under one roof. It's very hard to do that from a pragmatic perspective because of different regulatory agencies and. Etc. But perhaps we can design trials that um, work in parallel or work in ways that uh, are, are designed to complement one another. Um, but I think one of the things that this work has done has really unified the international community. We all work together on, on an ongoing basis. We share data. We share samples. Um, it, it really it's it's a remarkably interactive. Um, Group of investigators, uh, and and we are in the process, I hope, of uh, being able to work collaboratively at a clinical level as well. Thank you. Um, from Dr. Wainwright, thank you for such an interesting talk. Is there a molecular signature which predicts risk for adverse consequences from chemotherapy or radiation? Um. Not, not a well-defined. I'd say uh, we do know, for instance, that that people who have um, a an inherited um, predisposition to neuropathy can have catastrophic effects of uh, 
chemotherapy. So, and, and those who, who've been involved in following kids in oncology for, for neurology on the oncology service know that every once in a while you get a patient, a, a, a leukemia patient who just has catastrophic neuropathy that where they be almost become paralyzed and, and they have a very, very, very slow uh, recovery from that. Some of those, are the, the genetic, it must be a genetic basis uh, because they're all getting the same uh, treatments. Uh, the genetic basis of some of them is not known. And I've always said that's a great project for somebody to get involved in. I haven't done it myself. Um, but other than that, not yet. I mean, I, I, I think that uh, th these are very blunt um, treatments uh, that, you know, when you irradiate the brain of a three-year-old, no matter what molecular signature or the tumor is, it's bad news for the brain. And um, uh, we, we, we have not found any protective genetic um, profiles uh, for the nervous system. It, really what we need to do is dial back on the, on the harmful treatments. Thank you. And we're just about out of time, but Dr. Um, Doherty put a link in the chat um, feel free to join NDV, I think that's Neurodevelopmental Rounds, in the next hour to hear about outcomes in this patient population. So kind of goes with some of the previous questions. So thank you for that, Dr. Doherty. And with that, I think we are just about out of time. So I will okay. say thank you so much, Dr. Pom Pomeroy, for joining us from Boston. Thank you to the Sarkovskis for this lecture and Dr. Wainwright for organizing it. To all our audience for attending every week and have a great day. We will see you all next week. Thanks so much for all of your work. Thanks, Dr. everybody. Pomeroy.